Before we start, let me ask you a question. And it's going to be the same question I asked last week. So if you were here last week, you're probably able to answer this quite, uh, quite easily. What is the key theme of the book of Romans? Now, I said last week, I said, if you've been a Christian five years, you should know this. If you've been a Christian 10 years, you should definitely know. What is the key? If you're one of the elders in the church, boy, you should know this. All right. What, if you were just here eight, seven days ago, you should know this. What is the key thing? Now, people are thinking, oh, no. Shall I pick on somebody? Oh, Pam knows. All right, I'm just going to let you sit there smug. What is the key theme? <laughs> what is the key theme of the book of Romans? And I think you could say, actually, this is, he's picking this key theme from the whole of the rest of the Bible. He sees it in the rest of the Bible and he brings it out in the book of Romans and he makes sure that we all get it. But then we don't get it, do we? And we don't remember it. So what's the key theme? Of the, I was hoping this bit would be over quicker by now. <laughs> Pam. Justification by faith. Now, that may be a bit of Bible speak, and you're thinking, what on earth does that mean? It simply means we get right with God. We get our relationship good and how it should be with God, not by keeping all the rules. We get right with God by putting our faith in God, trusting what he has done for us in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We do that, and God, in turn, shows us amazing grace, and he forgives us, and we are good with God. Chapter 1, justification is revealed, justification by faith. Chapter 2, uh, it talks about the universal need for, for, for us to get right with God, to be justified. Chapter 3 talks about how justification by faith works. Chapter 4 talks about Abraham and David, and said so these are poster boys. These, are, these were examples of justification by faith. Abraham is about as old as you get in the Bible. And he's an example of what? Getting right with God by keeping the rules? No. He's an example of justification, getting right with God by placing our faith in God. Now, Paul is not daft. As he builds this argument up, he knows what questions are coming. So in verse 1, he asks a question he knows is coming. And then in verse 15, he asks another question that he knows is coming. He knows he's going to face these questions. So what does he do? He asks them first. The two questions are virtually the same. You, you, you split a hair between them. They really are. So if you look at verse 1 and verse 15, you'll see the two questions there. Shall we go on sinning that grace might increase? That's question in verse 1. And then verse 15, shall we sin because we're not under the law? Slightly different wording, basically the same question. So this morning's service, we're looking at uh, the, the, what, 15 to 23 and then on into chapter 7. But if you divide chapter 6 up, and if you say verses 1 to 14 are the main course, would you then look at verses 15 to 23 and say that's the pudding? Right. Actually, you wouldn't. If you were to divide it up like that, verse 1 to 14 is the main course, and verses 15 to 23 are second helpings. Put your hand up if you like second helpings. <laughs> All right. I love second helpings. You may be thinking, oh, I don't know about in this. All right, but that's what it is. He is telling us the same thing again. Second helpings. An old university lecturer, he used to say this, when the wood is thick... You have to hammer even harder to get the nail in. I used to tell that to all his students at the beginning of lectures. When the wood is thick. Now, Paul is not saying that the, the, the people in, in Rome here, that us today, we're thick. Paul wants us to get the message, so he keeps hammering it home. The message that we get right with God, not by working hard and impressing God, by, by placing our faith in God and what Jesus Christ did. He's not saying this because they're thick. He's saying this because the idea of getting right with God, earning our way up, can be deeply, deeply rooted into our psyche. And it's a hard idea to shake off. And in Romans chapter 6, he's telling us again, in 1 to 5, we get right with God through placing our faith in God. Now, if you, uh, if you were uh, someone like um, John Stott, actually, he points out there's a subtle difference between verses 1 to 14 and verses 15 to 23. The difference is, in verses 1 to 14, Paul emphasises the benefits. 
We are united with Christ. We are alive to God. The benefits of justification by faith. In verses 16 to 23, he talks about the responsibilities. It means we have a new master. We're slaves. We're servants of God. So there's a different emphasis. So now we come to this morning's question, our our title. Does it matter how I live if God forgives? That's a big question, isn't it? Does it matter how I live if God forgives? As a child, I lived in a small village surrounded by, by fields. And in summer or winter, I'd, I'd be out and about with my mates. And we'd go sledging, obviously not in summer, but in winter. Uh, we went fishing, we, we, did it, we went into ponds, we, we went into streams, we built dens, we climbed trees, we played football, we played cricket. And I would nearly always come home, grass stains on my knees, covered in mud and pond slime and all the rest of it. I can remember being so mucky... That I walked, I remember walking in, and we'd kick our shoes off in the porch, and I just stomped straight in to find the television. All right, I can remember doing that, and mum grabbing me at the door and pushing me all the way back into the porch. And I had to get completely undressed in the porch. And I can remember standing in the porch, in my sort of Superman underpants, <laughs> waiting for mum to get me new clothes, because I was so mucky and filthy. I can remember, you probably think back, I can remember the man from Prudential coming while I'm standing there in my <laughs> underpants. I can just remember thinking, I'm just glad my underpants were clean. Now, it didn't matter how dirty I got, somehow mum could always get me clean again. Two things as I look back. I think I never really noticed the muck. You know, if mum wasn't there at the door to see me coming in, the kitchen and the house looked out. If mum didn't see me coming in, I could be in front of that television, having been, what, half an hour before wading through a pond, and then half an hour later I could be in front of that television. And usually either the smell or the muck meant that I was stopped at the door. I never really noticed the muck but mum did. Another thing, I never really ever thought of it from mum's point of view. I never really thought how long it took to wash those clothes. I can remember the seeing them sitting in buckets, soaking. I never thought of it from her point of view. Does it matter how I live if God forgives? The answer is yes, it matters especially when we see it from God's point of view. I never saw it from my mum's point of view. Especially when we think how much it costs to bring us forgiveness and to enable a just God who loves us to forgive us. When we think that through, I never thought about how much time it took mum to clean me up and to clean my clothes up. I never thought about it. Does it matter how I live? Yes, it matters, especially when we think of it from God's point of view, what it took to clean us up. Last week, we thought about verses 1 to 9. We're dead to the penalty of sin. And yet we still struggle with sin in our lives. And yes, we're dead to the penalty of sin, and we are being saved from the power of sin. And the Bible then tells us that we one day will be saved even from the presence of sin, so it's not even around us. And then we thought about that last week. We are dead to the penalty of sin. We also thought about we're under new management. We're not meant to go back to the way we were. We're not meant to go back to the the life we lived before. We often see Christians do exactly that. And that is a big derailment often. You see, when you choose the way you live, and then change the way you think to suit your way you live. People do that. Instead of allowing our thinking to dictate the way we live, we sometimes allow the way we live to change our thinking. So tonight's, uh, tonight's goodness, this morning's title, Does It Matter How I Live If God Forgives? The answer is yes. Now it's subtly different from, from, from what we had uh, last week, but it is basically second helpings the same as last week. So I've got three very quick points. The first one is, as you read through these verses, the first one is the paradox. We are told in these verses that we are free from sin, but we are not free to sin. And there's a difference. We are free from the influence, in some respect, 
of sin. It has less influence on us. We're certainly free from the penalty of sin, but that does not mean we are free to sin. Verse 15, shall we sin because we are no longer under law but under grace? Paul answers, no. You're not free to sin, but you are free from sin. Do you remember the story, John chapter 11? Remember the story of Lazarus? And Jesus stands at the grave of Lazarus and he calls him out. What's happened at that point? Lazarus is free from death. He's been freed from death. He walks out and there in front of everybody, they see what should be the dead and decomposing body of Lazarus is now fully alive and walking out. And what's the next thing Jesus says? He says, take off the grave clothes. In other words, look, now he's alive. He shouldn't be wearing all the stuff that goes with death. And we as Christians, we have been brought back to life. Ephesians 2 tells us that. But too often we want to keep on the grave clothes. We need to take off what is associated with death. Do you follow the, do you follow the logic of that? In Monopoly, uh, I love the game Monopoly, although it takes hours. <laughs> and, and you play with some people from church and they cheat big time. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, would you? Anyway, I won't mention any names. All right. In the game of... Sorry. <laughs> In the game of Monopoly, you have a get-out-of-jail-free card. All right? Now, nice things to have, a get-out-of-jail-free card. The Christian, for the Christian, grace is the Christian's never-ending, gold-plated, get-out-of-jail-free card. It releases us forever from the penalty of sin. If you're playing Monopoly, you don't really want to use your get-out-of-jail-free card. Because once it's used, it's gone in Monopoly... All right, and then it takes you back to jail, and then you've got to kind of start again from, from where that is. So you don't really want to use it. What you really want to do is get on and win the game. Grace, God forgiving us even though we don't deserve it, is the Christian's never-ending, gold-plated, get-out-of-jail-free card. It doesn't mean that your aim in life is to make the most possible use of the get-out-of-jail-free card. That is not the aim. Because that would be an abuse of God's grace to you. And I do think there are points when God says, no more. Plus, it puts us in the way of sin and temptation, and it takes you, you can lose control. And Paul is kind of spelling out in, in Romans chapter 6 just that. God has given us amazing grace. But that doesn't mean we abuse that grace by making the most of our gold-plated, never-ending, get-out-of-jail-free card. We want to live as if we've taken off the old life, the old grave clothes, and we're living the way God wants us to live. This is what it says in verses 16 and 17. This is taken from the New Living Translation. Once you were slaves to sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching. We have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteous living. You were slaves to sin. Now you're slaves to God. You wholeheartedly obeyed the teaching. That The teaching there Jesus is to, uh, Paul is talking about is, is the gospel. The idea that we get right with God through justification, through faith. Verse 18, now you are free. No longer serving sin but serving God. It's not free with no master, but it is free with a better master, God, righteousness. And this brings us on to the next point. Choose your master wisely. Choose your master wisely. I remember about 30 years ago, and it really is that long ago. I, I know what you're thinking. You can't think it can't be that long ago that you took your driving test. But it is about 30 years ago I took my driving test. I remember passing. For the first time in my life, I was absolutely free to drive anywhere I wanted, any time I liked. No one would say, mirror, signal, manoeuvre. No one was going to say, at the next junction, turn. I was free. And then something hit me like a, almost like a truck. This isn't actually, this is not literally. I remember feeling so free that I could drive anywhere I liked. And then I remember asking mum if I could borrow the car. 
And I was free, providing mum didn't need the car. I was free, providing my brother hadn't already booked the car. She booked it. It was booked and written in a diary. I was free, providing I had the money to pay for the petrol for the car. I was free, providing I managed to get back before mum or my brother needed the car. I realised, actually, I wasn't free at all. I wasn't. And truly, we are never absolutely free. There are always restrictions. So instead of trying to get some mythical freedom that isn't there, better still, choose the right master. We think of slavery in Bible times as, well, slaves were either captured from enemies or they were bought at the marketplace. And that is true. A lot of slaves were either captured or bought. But many slaves were slaves kind of, I mean, this is perhaps a bad way, but kind of by choice. In that they were so poor, it's not really a choice, but it is a choice. They were so poor that they chose to be slaves for food, for clothing, for lodging. Now, in those situations, what did you do? You made sure you chose a good master. We are never really free, ever. So what do we do? We make sure we choose the best possible master. And that's one of the things that's coming out here. Verse 16, don't you realize that you... Uh, that, that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey. People that perhaps don't grasp that. We become the slave of whatever we choose to obey. We can never really escape slavery, so let's make sure we choose the right master. If you've been freed from sin, don't go back to the old master and become a slave to sin again. We see it around us, don't we? We do. Drugs, drink, pornography. We can mention all sorts of things. Often they end up enslaving the very person that at first took them as a delight. And then they enslave that person. And it's true with all sin. Eventually it enslaves. Paul's saying, don't go there. Take the grave clothes off. Don't you realize that when you start obeying that master, you, you become controlled by that master? The application for us here and now, if we're saying that we can never really escape slavery, let's make sure we choose the right master. The application for us is to take conscious steps to be a slave of what is good and right, to be a slave of God, and also to make conscious steps not to be slaves to sin. In verses 19 to 23, Paul is getting us thinking. He's thinking, he's getting us to think about, he's asking certain questions and answering them. He's saying, Who are we serving? That's what he's saying in 19 to 23. Are we serving sin or are we serving God? And then he kind of brings out, what's the outcome of your service? Well, if you serve sin, the outcome is that you feel ashamed. And then death. And if you serve God, the outcome in verse 22 is holiness and then eternal life. And then he also brings out in verses 19 to 23, how is the outcome reached? Well, the outcome with sin is paid as a wage. In other words, you earned it, you get it. I don't know about you, I quite like the idea of wages. But when it comes to sin, it pays a wage. And I don't like the idea of wages when it comes to sin. How is the outcome reached when it talks about holiness and eternal life? We're talking holiness, um, well, eternal life, we're talking a gift. The wages of sin, sin pays a wage, is death. The gift of God is eternal life. What does that come back to? Justification by faith. Have you earned eternal life according to Romans 6.23? No. What have you got? You've got this incredible gift that you could never earn. What are you actually earning? You're earning death. There's this incredible contrast between what you earn and God's incredible gift. And it's, it's, it's laid out for us there in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The final little thought is this. We are released to serve in a new way. We are released to serve in a new way. 
There's a lovely story, and I've told it before. A woman got married. Her husband was cruel and a, a, a brutal man. And he demanded that she did all sorts of work around the house. In fact, he would leave her a list of what to do. And if he, if he didn't find it all done, when he came back, he would give her what for. Now, this woman's husband, her first husband, died. And she married again. And her second husband was a loving and gentle man. A, a, a real delight. Complete contrast to what she got before. One day, as she's cleaning the house, years after the death of her second husband, and now in this loving relationship, she's cleaning the house, she moves something back, and she finds on the floor a list. The list is one of the lists her first husband had written out for her. She looked at that list, and she said to herself, herself I am doing everything and more on that list. Was she driven by fear? No. She was driven by love. We're told to serve in a new way. We have been released to this picture in 1 1 to 6 of being released. We're no longer married to to a tyrant husband. He's dead and we're now released. And then this is what he says in chapter 7, verse 6. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in in the new way of the Spirit. And not the old written code. Service from the Spirit. Service driven by love. In these uh, verses, chapter 6, we see three kind of pictures. Baptism. We are dead and buried to the old life and we are joined and united to Christ. And then we see the picture of slavery. But we're dead to the old master and we should go on serving a new master. And then we see the picture of marriage. We're committed to a husband, but he dies, and we're free. And the Christian is released. Three illustrations, the same basic point. The same basic point. Christian, the Christian, is released, free from the old master of sin and the law which led to death. And now we can serve under grace, knowing, actually, we've already got it all, We're not serving to get the prize. We're serving because we've got the prize. And that's different. Because then we serve out of love. And I think the point that that Paul is, is, is getting back to constantly, justification by faith should lead to service and obedience driven by gratitude for all God has done for us and guided by the Spirit. That's so important. Let me say it again. Justification by faith, the idea of getting right with God by placing our faith in God, should lead to service and obedience driven by gratitude. All God has done for us and guided by the Spirit. I know it's a big chunk that we've gone through and I haven't really dealt with everything that is in the passage. But just to sum up, the paradox. We are free from sin if we're Christians, but we're not free to sin. Secondly, if we can never really escape slavery, then the most important thing is to choose your master wisely. And then thirdly, we are released to serve in a new way, to serve from the point of view of love and gratitude and to be guided by God's Holy Spirit. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. So the race is finished and the work is done. It does take determination. It does need us to fix our eyes on him. Maybe we've chosen the wrong master and we recognize that. Or maybe we need to come back to the right master. Maybe we've thought of ourselves as free, not just from sin, but free to sin. And we don't, we haven't recognized that we need to put things right. Let me ask you, are you living under the freedom of God's grace? Are you serving in response to that grace? I hope and pray that you are. But let's pray now that we all are provoked to do just that. Father God, we come to you now and we thank you for the freedom we have because of your wonderful grace. We thank you that you even bother with us and we praise you 
for all that you mean to us. We ask that we would be serving you in response to all you have done for us, our heart filled with gratitude and guided by your spirit. We ask this now for Barbara. We ask this now for our whole church. Amen.